and this is God protects Moses. All right, so we're moving on into the Exodus. I'm going to give you a lot of information this morning. I don't foresee getting through all of it, so this is probably going to be one of those where I have to cut it, and then it will pick up next week. Um, there's a lot on Moses. There's a lot of historical information on Moses. When I was researching the Exodus, um, I found Moses um, in the ancient maps. You can see him on the ancient map. You just have to learn to read a different language. And you can see over and over, Musa, 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 Musa. And I'm going to show you that as we go along. It's not going to be all in one lesson. So I'm going to try to give you scripture, then I'm going to try to give you the history with it, just to kind of break it up a little bit, because there is a lot of scripture. And with the lesson that we have, they, they jump. You know, we've seen that in the past few weeks. I'm not going to jump. I went and I put the rest of the verses with it so you can get a complete picture of what's going on because I hate the jumping. All right. <clears throat> so, um, oops, sorry. Our memory verse, Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We use that verse all the time. It applies to Moses, it applies to us. I mean, God's word is always, always relevant. Um, in, in their uh, slideshow, it says, what might have happened to Moses while floating down the Nile? If you put a baby in a basket and you put him in the Nile River, what could have happened to him? He could have drowned. Something could have eaten him. We know there's crocs in there. Bad person could have found. I mean, there's endless possibilities of what could have happened, but God protected him, and He protected him for a reason. And keep in mind, this is not Moses's plan. This is God's plan. Remember, God told Abraham all the way back four generations before. In the fourth generation, somebody's going to come. Remember, and Moses is in that fourth generation, so he's he already knows what's going to happen. Keep in mind that if this is a timeline, time starts in Genesis 1. One day there's going to be an end of time. It's going to be Revelation 20 verse 5-ish or 21 verse 5, something like that. So there's eternity past, eternity present. But God, being the creator of time, he's outside of it. He can look in at every single moment. So he knows what's coming. That's what makes him creator God. <clears throat> so we pick up in Exodus 8. Um, 1, 8 through 10. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. All right, we've already been going over all of the um, information about Joseph, a lot of the historical, archaeological information and whatnot. Um, he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. At this time, if you study Egyptology, Egypt was one of the biggest nations of the world. They had the best education of the day. Probably the only rival they would have had would have been in Assyria over towards Babylon at this time. It says, Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they might join our enemies and fight against us and go up out of the land. Now, I told y'all the last time, not last week, but the week before, about, you know, we have that movie. Have y'all ever watched the Moses movie, the old one? You know, it usually comes on like once a year or whatnot. And they always name the Pharaoh Ramses. And that's not his name. Ramses is mentioned in Scripture as a place. Ramses and Pithom are places, but they, they kind of go with it because they say, well, this is Ramses, and we have a pharaoh named Ramses, so Ramses must have been the pharaoh at the time. I don't believe that's so, and what I want to show you is why, and I'm going to give you two different scenarios, and I'll tell you my opinion on it. I'm not going to, I want you to, you to go through the evidence with me, okay? So one of the things about Egypt, let me zoom in just a little bit here. The Bible never tells us the name of the pharaoh. We don't know for sure who the Pharaoh is. The Bible doesn't mention it. All right, but 
we can get clues about who it might be. It says that there are several pharaohs in the running, but there is no definitive answer. Although it would be wonderful to know the pharaoh at this time, remember that it's God's story. All right? Keep that in mind. All right. So let me give you a little bit because I thought this was, this was neat. There's an old tradition that tells of a pharaoh having a dream. In the dream, there's a scale. On one side of the scale was Egypt, and on the other, a lamb. Isn't that neat? The little lamb outweighed Egypt. The Egyptian magicians interpreted this dream to mean that a child would be born to Israel that would destroy Egypt. That's, that's Egyptian tradition there. All right? Here's another, oops, another one. And Pharaoh told that he being asleep, had seen in his dream, and behold, all the land of Egypt was placed on a scale of balance. And a lamb, a young of the sheep, was in the other scale, and the scale for the lamb in it overweighed. That was the dream. And I won't read the interpretation because I just gave you the basics of it. So the first one that would, the first pharaoh that we would consider would be Amenhotep to Tutmos III. And you're like, who is that? You all know him. King Tut. King Tut. All right. So you're like, oh, that sounds familiar. Okay. So. <laughs> I wanted to pronounce the rest of it. So <laughs> uh, right. But, okay, look at this. Because we don't always get this. What's right there on the end? The third. No, no, no. Right here at the end of his name. Mose. Does it sound familiar? Mose. All right, keep that in mind. Okay, so this is scenario one. So Amenhotep would have possibly been the pharaoh at the time of Joseph. That's why I'm going through of who possibly was reigning during this time. And then he's going to look at his father, Ahmose, mother Ahmose Nefertari. You're going to see that Mose, Mose in a lot of different ones. So when the Pharaoh's daughter gets the baby out of the river and she names him Moses, it's not a stretch when we see the possibility of these being the Pharaohs at the time. So you have Tutmos the first, Tutmos the second, you have Hatshepsut. Remember that name, you've probably heard it before. Um, she was one of the fe female pharaohs, all right, um, Tutmos the third, and I put on here, note the similarity of almost Tutmos Moses, so this is a rendering of Amenhotep the first, possibly he's the one that's reigning during Joseph's time, this is Tutmos, or King Tut, this is the third, so this one would look familiar probably to y'all, now here's what I want you to, to see, this one, he's the interesting one. Tutmos the second has been discovered. All right, they found his mummy. All right, now I'm gonna get to that a lot later on. I've got a picture of his mummy, but it's a little bit later. All right, interestingly, it's covered with cysts from an unknown malady. So he, what he had, and you can see it in the mummy, and I didn't put it in here because I'm saving it for that plague. <laughs> when they had the plague of boils. Remember that? The plague of boils was everywhere, and you can even see them on his neck, even on his mummy, you can see them. Okay, so if he was at the time of the Exodus, we would expect to find boils on him, and that's exactly what we find, because he dies, you know, in the Red Sea not long after that. Okay, so it is possible that his body was fished out, you know, if the sea come crashing, they're going to get their pharaoh and give him a royal burial. Because during this time, the pharaohs wanted to be worshipped. All right? So they had 2,000 false gods. Why not add the pharaoh in there too, you know, and worship him as a god? So it would make sense that they get him out and give him that royal burial. So the cysts have been left behind from the sixth plague which brought boils to Egypt. 
Now I'm going to have more on that later. I'm just introducing it to you right now. The second scenario, and I've kind of leaned towards the first one, would be Amenahat the third. I don't even want to say this one. <laughs> Sobikneferu. Sounds like a Hershey. Um, Neferhotep. But, I, and again, um, you know, I really don't go with this because the other timeline matches up better. The names match up better. The people match up better, especially like with the boils and the cyst and what we find historically. So, these are the two possible scenarios that's out there. I'm going to give you both of them. You can make up your own mind. But I lean more towards the first one. It just makes more sense. Okay. All right, now back to Exodus 1, 11, and 12. Therefore they set taskmaster, taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities. See that? Cities, Pithom and Ramses. It's not the Pharaoh. It's a city. But the more they afflicted them, and the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. The harder they worked them, the more they multiplied. That was the opposite of what they wanted. Now here is the bricks at Pithom. I've already showed y'all this one week. Let me zoom in. Can y'all see the bricks? Y'all can see the brick outlines or whatnot. And they were building store cities. Store cities for what? Grain. Grain. They've already been through, um, you know, the, I want to say plague. Give me the word. Famine. Famine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So this is the bricks at, at Pithom. Now, um, here's something interesting that I found out too. Within the Torah, Joseph is referred to as Ivri. All right? Meaning Hebrew. He is also referred to Ha-ish, meaning man. Some believe that the Hikos or Hyksos capital, that would have been in the Goshen area, up there. Um, the capital would have been named after Joseph Ivrish Avarish because that is a city up in the north in Goshen. This is the same place where I showed you the house with the 12 pillars and the 12 graves and they had the statue of Joseph. All right, so we're you, you see how we're linking everything together. That would mean that the Hyksos capital was named Hebrew man. And it, it, you can find a lot in, um, in wordage. Lots of times in the Bible, every word, every name, it means something. Um, it, in history, you can find, especially like when you're, like say, tracing the generations after Noah, those 70 names, you can find parts of those names in mountain ranges, lakes, um, on old maps as, as countries or whatnot. Another thing about the Goshen area is that um, there were the four-room Israelite houses. And if you remember the video that I showed you of that house with the 12 pillars, and you had all the Israelite houses around it, and I told y'all to remember that, this is what it would have looked like. So when we say Hyksos, or Semite, or Asiatic, you're going to think Asia. That's not what it means, and I'm going to show you why in just a little bit. Just hang with me. So, Avarish is considered the Hyksos Asiatic Semite capital. Semite comes from Shem, which is Noah's son, of northern Egypt, which is in the Goshen territory. The town is close to Pithom and Ramses mentioned in the book of the Exodus. Avarish is close to the Fayim Oasis. You remember, that's where the Joseph Canal is, the Bahar Yosef. I showed y'all that. That was still named after him. It's still called that today. It connects to the Nile. Archaeologists have sifted through the sands of Avarish to discover four-room houses. Scholars refer to these four-room houses as the Israelite house. The architectural style was characteristically dominant through the Israelite settlements. It speaks volumes that the Israelite houses are found in Egypt within the Goshen territory, just where scripture tells us that the Israelites settled. So 
so we know that they were there. Sometimes when you're studying, you'll hear, oh, well, they were a small presence. If they were there, there's no proof that they were there. But this does prove that they're there. I'm giving you the evidence so you can see it for yourself. So 13 and 14, so the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service, which they made them serve, was with rigor. So this is um, from a tomb of Rechemeyer in Upper Egypt and Thebes. And what are they doing? Lay, lay in brick. So it just proves, you know, that they're making it and they're building with it at that time. And we've already seen the bricks at Pithom that I've already showed y'all. Okay, so 15 and 16. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the names was Shephira, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. All right? Remember the dream that I, that I told you in the beginning? If they had those dreams, dreams, dreams were, meant something to the Egyptians. They had these dreams and they thought somebody was going to come and and take over Egypt. Who does that sound like? Does it sound like somebody from the New Testament that killed the babies? Yeah. You see how Satan works. It's nothing new. It's already, yeah, it's already been done. Even today. Right? Right. You're 100% on. All right? But the midwives, what? They fear God over Pharaoh. That's the thing. They feared God over Pharaoh and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Now let's listen. Just Think about a mother expecting. Okay, if you're getting ready to have your child and you know that there is a death sentence to your child. you don't, We don't have sonograms back then. You don't know if you're having a male or female. Do you think you're going to call a midwife and take the chance of them killing your child? Or do you think you're going to try to do it on your own? I mean, there might be midwives, but there's possibly other females in your family that's going to help you give birth without midwife help. I mean, I'm just, I'm just giving reality to the situation here. You don't think they were lying to the king when they didn't give them it? That's a possibility, too. That's a possibility, too. Therefore, God dealt well with them, with the midwives and multiplied. I'm sorry, the people multiplied and grew very mighty. So the more you try... To, to stomp them out and give them this, the more they're going to multiply. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded what? What's that next word? All. all. It's not just the midwives that were commanded to do this now. It's all his people. That means all the Egyptians. So you don't have to just fear about the midwives anymore. You have to fear about any Egyptian coming. Now, how would that feel as a mama? I mean, any Egyptian can come up and take your baby. And it says, and every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. So any Egyptian can come up and take your child and throw it in the river. Makes me so mad reading that. <laughs> I think they would. I would think would be. I can't put some kind of child in front of a river, because especially a baby. Let me go back to what I said when I was when I was praying. In a society with no God, life is cheap. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I mean, these these people, Pharaoh's people, they have their own children. So 
And they may not have done it. They may. Mm-hmm. It might have been commanded to do it, but but they didn't do it. But I wonder how many children did die. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we're fixing to get into that too. Pharaoh, fearing the numbers, the growing numbers of the Hebrews, gave instructions to the midwives to kill all the sons born to them. Two of the mid midwives' names are given. Shephara and Pua, and we see from Exodus 1, 17 through 21 that they feared God more than Pharaoh and saved the male children, therefore God blessed them. When Pharaoh's original plan failed, he ordered all of his people to murder the Hebrew male infants by throwing them into the Nile. When we move on to Exodus 2, 1 through 3, it shows that Yachved, a faithful Hebrew mother, hid her child Moses for three months. Can you imagine hiding a newborn because what do babies do cry. they cry <laughs> they cry yeah we find evidence that this account is true and it's in a town within the goshen area called cahoon now keep that keep that in your head cahoon and again this is near the joseph canal in 1888 to 1890, Sir Flinders Petrie excavated Cahoon and discovered boxes buried underneath the town dwellings. These ordinary boxes would have been used to store common items or clothing. Petrie, however, found that these boxes contained the remains of in- infants that were just a few months old. Some boxes contained two or three infants inside. Some scholars believe this is to be the Hebrew babies that were ordered to be killed by the Egyptian pharaoh. So let me tell you this. If you're a mother, even if they took your child and they threw it in the river, and let's say your child drowned, what are you going to do? You're going to get your child. You're going to get your child, and the only safe place to bury it is probably underneath your dwelling. This is one of the boxes. And it's not just under one house it's in multiple houses <clears throat> and you know what what gets me is that this goes straight alongside what we find in scripture and to me it's like how can anybody deny that this happened you have scripture telling us and and you know god's word doesn't need to be backed up but when you find evidence like this because just like you were saying you know i don't want to think anybody would do that i don't want to think anybody would come and take a child you know Well, you know, when you see an injustice, when you see something like this, it should do something to us. Um, you know, we talk about you know, Jesus being love. Oh, Jesus is love. We've heard that quote. But because he is love, he hates things. He hates sin because sin hurts us. You love your child. Do you hate what hurts your child? Yeah, you do. And when it talks about, you know, sin, I can't help but think about Jesus. What did he say about the little children? They're not from the kingdom of God. Right. Right. And now we we live in a country where they march and call it a right to be able to to end a, a life. And it goes against everything that uh, God created us to be as as a mother. I mean, we're supposed to be the protective and nurturing type. Like Yachved, she hid her child three months because she loved him and she wanted him that bad. <clears throat> it and says she gave him away. Oh man, it gives me cold chills. That's one thing, but to give him away, mm-hmm. yeah, at three months old, just to for him to have a chance to live. But you know, God allowed her to nurture him. I know. That is so sweet. I just love that so much. But they nursed him for two to three months. But she didn't know that and she gave him away. Right, right, right. (laughs) Yeah. And a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife of the daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw him, he was beautiful he was a beautiful child, and she hid him three months. 
But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Okay, so parents of faith. Through God's plan, the daughter of Pharaoh would find Moses. We know that's going to happen. Moses' sister Miriam would then bring Jochebed to nurse him. You're like, whew, thank, good for old, thank goodness for older sister here. You know, she was a part of the plan as well. Um, only God in his divine timing had an arrangement that could orchestrate these circumstances and even allow Moses Moses' mother to be paid for nursing her own son. You know, I, I think of that, you, you know, she probably just never wanted to let him go when she had him. <clears throat> and it says in Hebrews eleven twenty three, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. Do you get that first two words? By faith. Because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. I think I'm going to have to end there. It's 10, is it 10, 17 or am I off? I don't know. It's always. Okay, okay, sorry. This one is telling me something. This is 10, 06, this is 10, 17. Okay, so um, then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. She knew where this child came from. So, even her being Pharaoh's daughter, she's an Egyptian, she was commanded to throw the child in the river as well. But she doesn't do it. All right? Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter says, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away. And nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. Moses, Moshe, you, that's the Hebrew name. If you go through um, the Arabic, it's Musa. You, you'll see that. Um, it means to draw out. David M. Howard Jr. states, in Egyptian, his name was probably Mos or Ram Ramos. This is similar to many known Egyptians' names at the time, like I was showing you with the pharaohs, like Amos or Chutmos. This is what it would have looked like in Hebrew at the, at the top. He was born about 1566 in Egypt. He would, have, he would die about 1446 B.C. His burial... Only God knows where he's buried. We'll get into that a little bit later, but he is the only one that God himself buried. Um, his wife is Zipporah. He had children, Gershom and Eliezer. Eliezer um, brother Aaron, sister Miriam, father Amram, and mother Yehokabed. Yehokabed. That's really hard to say. Um, <laughs> so let me give you this. This is where I was talking about Asiatic. Um, we think Asiatics is Asia, and it's not. Um, Asiatics, we could just use that term for um, the Israelites, you know, interchangeably. The Egyptians called the foreign Israelites A-A-M-U. Amu, um, that, that was their term for Asiatics. The Asiatic name was applied to the desert tribesmen from southern Palestine and to more northernly um, inhabitants of Syria and also was used to refer to the slaves who were bondsmen in Egypt. The Asiatic city of Cahoon, also known as El Lahoon, this is where the boxes were found, was a worker village and is located in the Fayim. That is where Joseph's Canal is, so this is all connected. Um, this is where the boxes were, I already said that. So, um, Sir Flinders Petrie excavated the city of Cahoon in the Fayim, and Dr. Rosalie David wrote a book about his excavations in which she said, It is apparent that the Asiatics were present in the towns in some numbers, and this may have reflected the situation elsewhere in Egypt. 
Their exact homeland in Syria or Palestine cannot be determined. The reason for their presence in Egypt remains unclear. Well, God's word is the one that tells us why they were there. They were there because this is part of God's, God's plan. All right. David Down writes in about evidence in this is evidence of a mass exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. He states that when the Israelites left Egypt, they seemed to leave behind tools and household possessions, which were found at Cahun. This is where the boxes were, including that the town was deserted suddenly. So it was just like they were going about their daily duties. They left their tools or whatever, and they just walked out, and they never came back. And that would also fit with what Scripture says. A.R. David states in his book, The Pyramid Builders of an Ancient World, it is apparent that the completion of the king's pyramid was not the reason why Cahoon's inhabitants eventually deserted the town, abandoning their tools and possessions in the shops and in the houses. There are different opinions of how this first period of occupation at Cahoon drew to a close. The quantity, range, and type of articles of everyday use which were left behind in the houses may indeed suggest that the departure was sudden and unpremeditated. God, he didn't give them a lot, a lot of time. He told them what to take, and that's what they took. It was, it was just that simple. So just to kind of sum this all up, and I'll end with this, Cahoon is located near the Joseph Canal. It's also in the Goshen area up at the top where the Israelites settled. Asiatics or Israelites were present in Cahoon. These Asiatic people, um, they were in groups of large numbers. This people group left very quickly. They left tools and other possessions in the shops and houses. Everyday articles were left behind, and the boxes of the remnants of infants were under the houses. That makes a very good case um, that aligns right with Scripture, just in the few Scriptures that we went over this morning. And I'm stopping. We're in the middle of, of just the first two chapters here. Um, so I'm going to stop right there, and we're going to pick up next week. I have a lot more on Moses and possibly his his real mother and father being found. So come back next week. <laughs>